Welcome to the Gamers Tavern and You All Meet in a Tavern, Episode 4, with our guests, Jason Marker and Brian Patterson. Tonight's topic is horror in gaming. Uh, okay, okay. I-, I know that sounds like last week's topic, but it-, it really isn't, I swear. This week we talk about the horror genre in gaming and how to put fear and terror into your Halloween-themed game, or if you're like us, your games any day of the year. I'm reminded of a quote from someone, I can't remember who, but they said, Halloween is the one day of the year the rest of the world catches up to us. Because I know I've had a few times when people have come over to my place in October and said, Oh, these skulls and cast iron candelabra and gargles are really awesome. You go all out for Halloween, don't you? And and I'm like, yeah, Halloween. That's why those are in my living room totally. Uh, But I'm getting off topic, and I think you folks need a drink, so head on over to the bar and grab some refreshments, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Hello, random stranger who's totally not just me using a different voice. Well, hello, incredibly handsome stranger. Hey, have you heard about the new Dementalism Kickstarter? It's totally awesome. It's this really great game, and I know you're going to love it. Really? Tell me more. Well, see, you play these guys who work for the Primordial Soup Kitchen, and a whole bunch of clones have escaped because of something you did because you really suck at your job, and you have to go out and collect them before you get fired or fed to something horrible. It's super, super fun, I promise. Oh, yeah? How do I find it? Oh, it's very, very simple. Just go to www.dementalism.com. Really? It's that easy? Yeah, and it's brought to you by Mother Oid Creations, the good people who brought you low life and other really awesome stuff. Dude, I totally have to check that out. So, you all meet in a tavern. Sitting in a dark corner is a man dressed all in black. Your host, Daryl Mott Jr. And sitting to his right, as always, is Ross Watson. Hello. Tonight, our guests in the tavern are Jason Marker. Hey there, guys. And Jason, what do you do in the gaming industry? I write a lot of words about spaceships. And what projects might our listeners know you from? I brought the new Robotech RPG uh, from Palladium back to market in 2008. Uh, I've also worked on all of the Warhammer 40k RPGs, uh, especially Road Trader. And I've worked on the new Star Wars Edge of the Empire and Age of Rebellion. Uh, so that's how Ross knows you, is through Fantasy Flight, and I'm assuming you've both geeked out over Robotech many times. I am totally yes. a Robotech nerd. When uh, when Ross hired me, Ross hired me as a freelancer at, at Fantasy Flight, and you know it was right after I had uh, gotten laid off at Palladium, and so I was sending out my CVs to everyone who would, who would listen, and I get a boilerplate email from Ross that says, you know, thank you for your interest in working for Fantasy Flight Games, da 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 you know, don't call us, we'll call you. I was like, all right, that's fine. About five minutes later, I get another email from Ross Watson. Oh, my God. Are you the Jason Marker? Who, who wrote the new Robotech RPG? Oh, my God. So, yeah. That's, that's exactly what I sound like, too. It's, it's uncanny. Never underestimate the ability of a fanboy to get you a job. Apparently so. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, we also have with us Brian Patterson, who you may know from D20 Monkey. Oh, uh, hey, guys. How's it going? So, Brian, what does your character sheet look like? As, as a person in the industry who gamers might know, what, is your, what does your character sheet say about you? Well, I'm a cartoonist. I do a webcomic called D20 Monkey. It's a very, very gamer-centric. Basically, it combines my love of tabletop gaming and cartooning, pretty much. <laughs> the short tagline that I always threw at people in the early days was, it's D&D and dick jokes. Pretty much. <laughs> D&D pretty but much I, revolves I, around dick jokes, right? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, most every table I've ever sat at. That's, yeah, that's and, in for, and in first edition, horrible, horrible puns. Yes, yes, which I'm keeping that tradition alive. I've, well, uh, thank God. Thank God for you, <laughs> sir. He, he who would pun would pick a pocket, <laughs> let me tell you. In addition to being a cartoonist, I have also worked as a freelance cartographer in the gaming industry. And for a brief period of time... During the third edition OGL days, I actually did a little bit of design work as well. I have actually freelanced for Fantasy Flight. Oh, right. oh sweet. What'd you work on? I worked on some of the Legends and Layers stuff, like Traps, oh, traps no and Treachery, the Path books, Path of Shadow. Me too. I was on Sorcery and Steam. Yeah, I actually did some stuff in that. Mm-hmm. Oh, sweet. So we, we have actually been in the same book we, already. We have been in the same book awesome. together. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> we have spooned in a book together at some point, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 
primarily people know me just these days. People know me from the comic. I've actually started doing a lot of illustration work for RPGs. Working for uh, Sand and Steam. Not Sand and Steam. Uh, yeah, it is Sand and Steam Productions. Uh, for School Days, and I recently did Project Ninja Panda Taco. That's mm-hmm. pretty cool. So, Brian, I have to ask, what part do you remember? What part of Sorcery and Steam you worked on? Um, I did a lot of the spells in that one. Oh, well, I did all the skills and feats. Did so. you really? That's awesome. Yeah. I like that well, book. It, it, I like that book a lot, too. <laughs> yeah. I have fond memories. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a, I, that's a big thing for me was, you know, when people make the, the connection, like at conventions and stuff, <laughs> I've had readers that recognize my name and went, wait a minute, aren't you the guy that did stuff in Traps and Treachery? Yeah. Did you write this trap? Yeah. You son of a bitch, you killed my character. <laughs> that's the best thing that's, right that's there. That's what you want to hear yeah. as a trap That's designer, exactly what right? you want to hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I wear that like a badge of honor. You know? <laughs> suffer, suffer not the player character to live. Well, let's. Uh, we just want to make sure and welcome both you guys to the You All Meet in a Tavern podcast, episode four. And Daryl and I both want to say thank you very much for joining us on our uh, Halloween-themed episode here, because tonight's episode is all about horror in gaming. Isn't that right, Daryl? That's right. A lot of people around this time of year want to run either one-shots or little mini-campaigns that are themed around horror for their normal tabletop game, or they might want to try out a new game. If you're trying to make that transition from heroic fantasy or science fiction to horror, there are going to be a lot of tricks and stumbles along the way, because horror in a tabletop game is a completely different beast from horror in other mediums. So that's one of the first things I wanted to talk about, is how do you define horror when it comes to gaming, as opposed to, say, a film? In a film, you can just, like, throw a bunch of blood and guts on the screen and call it a horror movie. That's the splatter genre. But... In a role-playing game, that is kind of the default setting, depending on your DM and players and how much detail they go into when it comes to killing the goblins. There's obviously something a little bit different when it comes to an interactive medium like gaming when it comes to putting horror in the game. So I, I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think makes a game a horror game as opposed to just a game that has scary stuff in it? Brian, do you want to go first? Sure. How do you define horror in gaming? Well, for me... I don't know how, you know, every GM is different, I think. We have a lot of consistencies, but everybody seems to have their own style. For me, horror is not something that is an exception to the rule. It's not a special event for me. Horror has always played a role in the games that I run, regardless of genre. And I think the best way to accomplish that is, honestly, I think you have to play on, it's like Daryl said, you can throw blood and guts on something, and... Oh, it's, you know, they call it horror. For us, in tabletop gaming and role-playing games, I think you have to work with what you're given, and that is, it's what you do not see. You know, for me, it's all about description and little dice rolls and really setting the scene to get the players on edge and get them tense, basically. And I think it's, it's something that you can do all the time. Now, for, for, you know, special Halloween games and things like that, you can certainly turn it up. But I, I think you just have to take advantage of the fact that the game is 90% imagination and give the players just enough to get them scared, if that makes sense. That's a pretty... That, yeah, that's a good answer. I, I like that one. Mm-hmm. So you're pretty much on the... I think Brian and I are pretty much on the same wave when, we, when it comes to the two key elements are tension and the unknown. Yes. Does that sound right? Yeah. You have to have that tension at the game table, because that's what really brings out horror in, across any medium, is you're tense because you're trying to... You're worried about what's going to happen next, mm-hmm. and what happens next is probably going to be a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I definitely agree with Brian a lot of those things. You know, I sort of want to expand on... I want to expand on the idea of sort of not showing them everything. I never let players see the monster until it's too late. Yeah, I love that. You know, I I really like horror. Most of the horror I run is like real sort of modern horror stuff. And it's set in very realistic settings. So when and I you know, and I don't I don't use zombies and I don't use sort of you know, sort of cliched horror things. You know, everything lurks in the dark, everything is, comes from you know, comes from behind the stars or comes from tens of thousands of years ago. And you know, it sort of creeps 
through cracks and down narrow alleyways and is always in shadow and to deal with it the players have to chase it you know and i never show them what it is until it's too late until it jumps out of the box essentially sounds very lovecraftian in that way yes, but that, very. I, I really like the i really like that lovecraftian idea of of the slow exposition and i also mm-hmm. like to give i also like to give my players enough rope to hang themselves with. <laughs> yeah. I, that's, I do that in, I do that in all my games but especially in horror games you know I'll use a lot of misdirection and I'll use a lot of uh, bad clues and bad hints yeah. mm-hmm. you know I will give I will give a player misinformation on a botched investigation roll mm-hmm. you know oh you failed your yeah. investigation roll well you find this out <laughs> you know yeah. or you know even even on a successful investigation roll sometimes you get bad information I'm a big fan of the dummy role. Mm, I'm, I'm a yeah. big fan of the a player's making a choice to do something, and I don't I don't make a production out of it, but I very calmly pick up a D20 in my case, pick up a D20 and just roll it and look at it and look at the group, and they, okay, continue. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> the other side of that is calling for a roll. Yeah. You know, why don't you make me a, why don't you make me a perception test? Oh, huh. Okay. And then carry on. Hey, that's that's a that's a joke my players have is when I call for those sometimes and it's they roll the dice and they know they've rolled low and it's well I've rolled a ten and I very calmly up oh, everything seems fine keep going yeah. <laughs> it's like that thing from Pitch Black right I thought you said it was clear I said it looked clear mm-hmm. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. it yeah no that's good and you know that reminds me of some uh, a tactic I've been known to use um, in my Shadows Angelus game which is. Uh, a horror game I ran for for several years, and um, there's a location in Shadows Angeles which is sort of not really in our world. It's sort of a bridge between our world and the the, the horrible you know cosmic creatures from beyond. And uh, when the player characters went to that region, I was very careful to only give information on failed perception rolls. <laughs> <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. Uh, you know, it, it added an interesting, you know, it added an interesting twist to the game, and because the player characters knew that they'd failed the role, mm-hmm. they knew that, but that was the only time they were really getting information about their surroundings, and it it, it did, you know, as 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 Daryl was just talking about, it did help kind of build that tension and create the atmosphere where they were, you know, really worried about what's going to happen next. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another thing, another thing that I like to do is I mix up my threats. Ross and I have talked about this. I, I run a game here that's it's essentially X Files meets Hill Street Blues. It's a oh, police it, it's a police procedural paranormal investigation game set here in Detroit. Yeah. So the, I, it's I did what? I did this it, I did something similar with Dark Matter. Yeah. It's it's called Thin Blue Line. And uh, it's, oh, like, it's it's set excellent. here in, it's I live in Detroit and it's set here in Detroit. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of times the cops from the Corktown precinct are you know, they're they're on the case and they're trying to solve a murder. That was caused by something obviously supernatural or obviously paranormal. But in the course of their work throughout the city, they're going to run into other bad things that happen day to day. You know, they're going to run into other crimes. Mm-hmm. And we got a lot of empty houses here in Detroit. Who's in that empty house? You know, is it a squatter? Is it a scrapper? Those dudes you don't really want to yeah. tangle with. You know, is it a pack of crackheads? Or is it a monster? And what's worse? Yeah. And how are we going to deal with this? And it's nighttime on the west side, and there's no street lights on, and we don't have any backup. That's what you have to. I think that's what you have to do with with horror games like that, especially like you said in a modern setting. It can't mm-hmm. always be this is something beyond the stars every time. Right. You have to have the right. mundane yeah. in there to keep them guessing. No. Mm-hmm. No, that's an excellent point. I was just going to build on that, Brian, mm-hmm. uh, because mm-hmm. you you make an excellent point. I think um, one of the best tactics to build tension in your game is to escalate slowly. Yes. And like Jason's saying, like you know, probably your first mission is probably not going to be a monster. It might just be a crackhead. But there might be some creepy things written on the walls, or the crackhead might know some creepy people. Mm-hmm. And you know, you take it to the next step, and the next step is those creepy people. Well, they are associating with rats that are behaving in a manner that's far too intelligent for rats. And you just kind of ratchet it up a little bit at a time, and that's that's a technique that I like to use so that, you know, you get into, maybe maybe it's the end of the session, maybe it's even the end of the third session, but by the time you've built things up to where people are, are, are getting really on edge, that's when you can spring that monster and really get the most yep. 
bang yeah. for your buck of the Absolutely. horrific elements in your game. I, I can think of a literary example of exactly what you're talking about, Ross. It was in the first Dresden Files book, Stormfront. Yeah. Uh, there was a drug that was on the street called Third Eye that when you took it, it was a magically enchanted drug that when you took it, it opened up your third eye so you could basically astrally per- perceive. And he was sitting in the police office waiting to go meet uh, special investigations and this junkie gets brought in and he's ranting and raving except for everything he's saying in his ranting and raving are things that a normal junkie crackhead shouldn't know (laughs) about the magical world to the point where he actually names look out for he who walks behind who was an eldritch horror that harry had fought as a teenager and harry's like how the fuck do you know about that and just the the implication that knowledge is out there and something is off somewhere, but you don't know what right. adds mm-hmm. to that tension. Something something is just a little crooked. Things don't line up yeah. quite well enough. I love throwing in background. I call it background radiation. It's you know little background details for players to pick up, and I'll just you know throw it into a description of a building, throw it into a description of a crowd. You know, oh, you know, da, 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 and just. Make sure they're paying attention. Make sure the players are paying attention because any little thing you say might be important. Any little thing you say might be life or death. Right. Use of description is really important, I think. In, in a horror game, I would even try and you know, put more emphasis on trying to describe and, and, and hit all of the senses. Talk about what mm-hmm. they smell, what they hear, how the, how the temperature is, you know, and, and just try and really ratchet up that immersion so that they, I, I think if they're more, if they feel more immersed in what's happening in game, they will be more likely to feel creepy at the right moments in the game. Right. A really, really good example of what Ross is saying right now comes in, again, one of my favorite games ever, Shadowrun. And one of my favorite authors for Shadowrun, Nigel Finley, he wrote a book called Universal Brotherhood, which I'm not going to say a damn thing about because I hate <laughs> when people spoil that twist because it is so fucking beautiful when you pull it on players who don't know the Shadowrun universe. Mm-hmm. And you oh can, my um, god, you can see their jaws drop. You can so, find out about the Universal Brotherhood if you play Shadowrun Returns, which is available yes. on Steam right now. So, Or you read Nigel's novel 2XS, which is right. the, num- the number 2, the letter X, and the letter S. It is one of my favorite novels. Not tie-in, not licensed. Favorite novels of all time. Wow. There is an adventure that comes in the Universal Brotherhood kit that's called Missing Blood. And there is a scene in that adventure that hits on every single one of those. And it's, have either of you guys, have any of you guys played the Missing Blood adventure or read it? No. No. I have. I haven't. Ross, Ross, you have? Yeah. You know the scene I'm talking about, the back of the pawn shop. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, the thing about that adventure, I think what you're, what you're connecting to is that, there are scenes that are written in that are very evocative of the senses. He talks about how it smells, how it, you know, how the air feels, how the the pressure is, you know, kind how of the building. baby cries. Yeah, exactly. Oh my god, I still just, get shivers. Just these little details. That is a really good way, in my opinion, to to build up that that tension. You know, that leads into another really good thing. Sort of that immersion is using the environment and the weather. Yeah, absolutely. You know. What is it? I think it's, is it, is it Do the Right Thing? That's the movie about the one day in Brooklyn where it's like 100 degrees and everybody's so angry because it's so hot, everything just unravels in the neighborhood. Dude, Predator 2. Yeah. Remember? It was all about the heat wave. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. God, it's been, it's been a thousand years since I've seen Predator 2. But, <laughs> but it's Danny Glover. Come on, man. Come on. There's, there's only one Predator movie. There's only one Predator movie and it's Predator. <laughs> I don't know what else you guys are talking about. <laughs> all right, all right. That's not. It's not. It's not what we're talking about. Highlander two here, for God's sake. Uh, it's a, Predator two wasn't bad. Ask Ross about. Ask Ross about my strong opinions. Jason <laughs> Jason Marker is a well known guy who loves bad movies, so that's why I mentioned uh, Predator two because I thought he would go. Oh yes, of course, it's a bad movie that I happen to there, have. There know. are awesome bad movies like Star Crash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like bar, like Barbarella. Like Dead Heat? Like Dead Heat, for God's sake. Toxic Avenger. Like Toxic Avenger? Yeah. Why don't we ask Brian? I think this is a good question for Brian. Okay. Daryl just, you know, basically mentioned that horror and gaming is is a combination of tension, which we've been talking about quite a bit, Uh and the unknown. So 
how do you feel about with you know characters and players knowing things like game stats of of the the bad guys and stuff like that in the adventure is that is that something that's bad for keeping that unknown factor or is there well i guess maybe a better way for me to phrase this question is what are the best ways a dm can use the unknown as a trope in his horror game as far as players players having the metagame knowledge you know oh once they figure out it's blank then they know what it is is that what you're getting at well, I, that's that's just part. I mean, I, that's a part of it, I suppose. But uh, however you would like to answer that question, you, you just go ahead and go. I think you just have to change it. Exactly. I mean, I, I mean, that to me, that's the biggest thing. If I have a, a table of complete, you know, when I have usually when I have a dinner party or something, or have a bunch of friends over, I usually run something. So there's a good chance that I'll have a table full of people who've either only played once or twice or never played at all. When that's the situation, just let it fly because they've never seen it, you know. But if you have a table of people who've gamed for years sitting there, I mean, I'll change things. I'll, I'll take the, I'll take one of the the sacred cows of gaming and just change it, change two or three things about it. I mean, that's I think description and presentation are key. You know, I can take two goblins and present the exact same goblin two different ways and make you laugh your ass off, or be genuinely terrified. Just in what they what they do and say, mm-hmm. and Paizo did exactly that in their first adventure path. I think it was back before Pathfinder was three point five, uh, the Rise of the Rune Lords. Yeah, I'm actually that running that right adventure, now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the first the first adventure is like the chaos of the goblins' attack on the city, and it's just complete chaos. And it's and it's less like you're fighting goblins and more like you're in the middle of that one scene in the Gremlins about midway through, mm-hmm. wherever where the Gremlins are going insane. And then you slaughter the three little encounters in the city, and things kind of calm down a little bit, and then you get into one of the most fucking horrific things I have ever seen in a role-playing yep. game, where the it's a goblin hiding in a closet. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yes, yeah, the goblin in the closet. Mm-hmm. After the attack yeah, on oh, after the attack on Sandpoint. You know. Oh my god, that thing is <laughs> fucking. I haven't even I haven't even had a chance to run it yet, but just mm-hmm. reading that creeped me the. Yeah. And you I know, think Daryl, for a guy who hates spoilers, uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna point that out. I think there's, I think there's a statute of limitations on that. That's an old model. Yeah, that one's that one's ten years. I mean, ten years. A ten year anniversary edition. Yeah, I think we're okay. You know, yeah. but it's, it's but <laughs> to I'm, me, here I'm gonna but, spoil Keep on the Borderlands for you. <laughs> I'm actually, get, I actually have a great story about Keep on the Borderlands. From hopefully soon we'll be able to get him on, but uh, Jim Butcher. He took Keep on the Borderlands and turned it into the zombie apocalypse. In the modern sense of the Night of the Living Dead version of the zombie apocalypse, where hmm. there were walkers all over the place, and he had all these little special rules set up where if any person's uh, separated from the party, every minute he rolls a d6, and if it ever comes up one, a walker comes out out of nowhere to try to grab him. And then they get bitten, and if they get bitten, they can turn into a zombie from the bite transmission. But I want to say something about what Brian said about changing things. One thing I almost always change, I'm kind of spoiling this if any of my players ever listen to this podcast, but I've never understood why vampires have a weakness to silver. Ever. Yeah, they shouldn't. Because silver represents the moon, nighttime. That's, it's been its symbolism since ancient Egypt. Gold has always symbolized the sun. So in any game I ever run, the player's like, oh, we have to go fight this vampire in his lair. Okay, let's stock up on silver weapons. So I could kill a vampire with bling in your game. <laughs> oh, dude. No, no, no. no. no just put, in a, grill, just put in a grill and bite him. That, that's how you fix oh, it. That's what I was God. thinking. <laughs> <laughs> My next character for Daryl's game is Flavor Flav. I think I, just, oh. I think I just realized, and this is the moment where I realized I'm never going to play in one of Daryl's games now. <laughs> he will never allow me to sit at his table. No. Well, you know, I want to I want to ask um, Jason about something because he has told me about this technique he's used uh, in one of his games. Jason uh, was doing a game about the uh, creature in the pipes. Jason, can you can you tell us about how you? Uh, Built the tension up with your group. Oh, the, yeah, the thing in the hotel. Uh, basically, the, the 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 short background of it was, you know, it was a 
a hotel that had been empty for ever for you know 30 years an abandoned high rise and it was being renovated and it had a higher than normal rate of fatal accidents among the construction workers <laughs> this is you know this is sort of using using putting something where you least expect to see it and the whole story was there was a naiad in the in the basement in the flooded basement and when they pumped the basement out it fled into the pipes and it was living in the pipes and it was trying to chase all the humans out by pushing them out of windows or drowning them you know the, that's cool the player character you know the the cops had to go in there and try to figure it out and what you know one of the things that i would do is when i was you know when they finally made contact with it you know and it's it's out of its head with anger right it's like completely mad with anger and rage and pain now because you know these stupid humans took away its home you know in an old building that knocking sound that water will make running through pipes sometimes Mm -hmm. you know i would you know i would sort of like walk around the table while they were you know i I made this you know this setup where they contacted the spirit you know this naiad and she's in these pipes all around them and she's rattling the pipes as she's talking to them right and i'm like hitting the table you know, I'm beating on the table, making that noise and everything. And then I'm walking around the table and I get to the, uh, the player who's doing the, the talking. And this is at a, this is at a con, mind you, these people don't know me. And I think, <laughs> and I think that's the way that worked is because they, that's they, even didn't better. Know me, they didn't know what to expect. And you, you know, like basically, you know, I, she asked a question, like she asked the spirit a question and I leaned, I was right behind her when she did. And I leaned down really close to her and I went, get out. And I started screaming at her. Yes. And yeah, basically I was standing behind her and I'm talking around her head and I'm using this. I use a lot of like voices and yeah, same you know, here. noise, noises and sound effects. And it scared the pants off of the entire table, you know? And they're like, Oh, this is, Oh, this is serious business. How are we going to deal with this? And I thought that was a neat technique. I really, I when you told that story, I was like, oh man, I want to steal that. It was pretty great. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was pretty great. And uh, sort of tangential, that story, that that game is based on a on an IRL thing here in Detroit. We recently renovated a, a hotel called the Book Cadillac Hotel. A gorgeous old building had been empty since the eighties, and every basement in Detroit is full of water unless it's being actively pumped out. And the basements, the three, the 30 feet of basements, the three levels underneath the book Cadillac were full of water. And they pumped it out over a series of days. And this is in January, so it's very cold. And they went, mm-hmm. they like, you know, were off work for three or four days for a long weekend. They came back and the basement was half full of water. Again. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's not supposed to happen. So they drain it out again and they send guys all the way down to the third sub-basement in hazmat suits. Uh, you know, because it's full of asbestos and rat bodies and, you know, just junk, right? And they get down there and they find a 10-inch water main open, pumping water into the basement of the book Cadillac. And the punchline to that is that water main was not on the water map. Oh, God. The city wow. of Detroit, nice. had, the city of Detroit had no idea it was there. Now, that's that happened in real life. And so I took that idea and ran with it, and that's how the Naiad got in there through that pipe. And she could never get back out because the pressure was so high. And you can find all sorts of stories like this in your real world. Uh, There's something similar here in Texas. In uh, Galveston, back in 1901, I believe it was. Oh, the Galveston flood? No, the huge hurricane. Or the hurricane, yeah, yeah, the hurricane. The hurricane that hit. And it hit Galveston. This is before they had a seawall. and They built up the city like fucking 10 feet after this happened. But it hit the city. There was no warning. There was no... Just suddenly, hurricane, bam. Yep. Smashed Damn. the city. It was, until Katrina, the biggest devastation from a hurricane in United States history. It basically flattened the entire city. Pretty much. And if you, and I will tell you, if you kind of dig the macabre thing, if you ever in Galveston, especially for Space City Con, which is coming up in Galveston in January, but if, if you're into that kind of thing, go to their graveyard Ooh. in Galveston. You can see the pre- you can see tombstones there that are from before the hurricane. And it's fucking creepy and cool and really, really awesome. But there's a thing about Galveston. It flattened the city, but not everything. There were a lot of buildings that survived the hurricane. And to this day, 
when they'll sit there and demolish something that was from before the hurricane to build something new, Mm -hmm. when they're ripping out the walls and shit, they will find fucking bodies and skeletons from the hurricane trapped in the walls. Yeah. That's beautiful. (laughs) Are you, are you, so are you familiar with Tom Rush? Who's a singer from the sixties? I am not. He's got a phenomenal song about that storm. It's called, it's called Wasn't That a Mighty Storm. Before we get too far off, I want to make sure uh, Brian gets a chance to talk about any techniques he's uh, used in his games as well. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> Actually, I'm enjoying... <laughs> I enjoy <laughs> listening to gaming stories just as much as I love talking about it, so that's fine. Oh, all right. uh, as far as, like, any kind of, you know... Uh, going back to the convention game, okay? The the using the players at the table as a prop. You know, that's... Uh, to me, that's key. It just... Uh, doing things like that it just pulls those players into the situation. You know, suddenly you're between little sound effects and whispering in their ear, you know, and things mm-hmm. like that. I've had moments in, in horror situations like that where, by and large, most of my players do not keep, you know, like tablets and things like that at the at the table, but... Those are not allowed at my table. I use them, I, I allow them for no other reason than... You know, there are a lot of family, you know, a lot of family people at the table, just in case, you know, an emergency, whatever. But well, um, having your pockets, one thing, having it out on the table, checking Twitter is another. Yeah, that's that's different, obviously. But to me, it was one of those situations where in a horror where I knew the session was going to be horror and possession based. You know, I knew that at some point X player was probably going to be targeted for possession. You know, during oh my this. God, it's happening again. <laughs> I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry for interrupting you. This is something that's been creeping me out for two fucking episodes now. On my end of the audio, every single time I edit it, I have the paranormal activity noise that just pops up on my form. I can't hear it when I'm recording. But when I'm editing and listening to all this again, I think that <laughs> shows up in the goddamn thing. And it's creeping me the fuck out. Is my house haunted? What the fuck? That, that's yeah, I a message. Up, I grew up in a haunted oh. house. Or I lived in a haunted house for a couple of years. So, Well, you know what we're doing with the podcast, right? Is we're just setting up a giant seance. Yeah, it's exactly. getting more powerful. <laughs> 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 okay, where's James Randy? I want to claim my prize then. <laughs> no, seriously, that's a... Uh, sorry, go ahead, Brian. You were, you were saying... I, I apologize for interrupting. I just... That, Oh, no, that's fine. Every time I see it happen on the waveform. But go ahead, Brian. Oh, no, it's okay. I'm just, (laughs) I'm just, I'm I'm hoping nothing bad happens over there. I've I've seen those movies. I know bad shit happens when you hear those sounds. Uh, Maybe you should just move. Just, just, (laughs) just move. You guys, just just move and burn the house down. You guys know the old Eddie Murphy gag about, uh, yeah, about, um, yeah, Mm -hmm. get out, right? (laughs) Too bad bad we can't stay. Too bad we can't stay, baby. Get out. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I I do not know that one. God, it's I, so uh, it's, funny. It's a classic. Yeah, it's, a it's, classic. it's oh, is that SNL or no? It's just part no, of his stand up uh, where he talks about his old stand up. Really? Yeah, he talks about he talks about why you know it's it's like you know what is it with white people in horror movies? They don't take hints. Oh, yeah. oh, oh okay, I remember yeah. it now. Anyway, well, yeah. we've completely interrupted Brian again. So yeah. go ahead, Brian. <laughs> oh man, it's okay. <laughs> Trust me, I don't take offense. Uh, what was I even saying? Oh, yeah, uh, the whole cell phone thing. The short version of the story was I knew a player would be targeted for possession. So I actually, before the session, like, scripted out several text messages to send the player. Oh. <laughs> um, so, awesome. so that So that just at, at a completely random time, <laughs> or random to them, I just grabbed my phone very calmly behind the screen and hit send. And all it said was, hey, man, I need you to, I need you to say this. Sound possessed, and <laughs> almost half oh, screaming, just kind of interrupt somebody. Nice, that's awesome. And that... the clerics standing there telling, tell, talking about how we need to be diligent in the face of evil, and the wizard of the group suddenly just starts screaming, you know, the the the, <laughs> the dialogue. And I, and I even kind of told him in the text. I said, "Look, make kind of make it your own, but here's the point you need to get across, you know." And <laughs> they awesome. loved that's it. Cute. It just it just freaked them the hell out. You know, because they were like, they no, didn't see cute. it coming. You know, it wasn't. Hey, you come with me. I need to tell you something. There was no note to pass. You know, it was. Yeah. And I think that you have to do things like that sometimes to keep, especially veteran players guessing. 
You know, that's you know what, though? The, the step into my office and let's have a talk thing where you step away from the table. That yeah. can, can be very effective, and I've used it as a bluff before. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I played a mole in a long running riffs game one time, and I was oh. I was the mole in the party for months and months and months. The thing that you know Brian said I thought was really cool is just the way he kind of set it up ahead of time with the text messages and everything, and it reminded me of something I really wanted to try. Um, actually, based off of a Doctor Who episode. Uh, I would. I wanted to have a, a, a kind of a, a similar thing where I set it up ahead, ahead of time with the player and um, basically just, you know, come up with some kind of innocuous gesture at the table. Like, you know, just tell the player, every time I pick up my pen and put it down facing you, you know, uh, count down from 10. So just one number at a time. So every, every so often this player would just, you know, suddenly burst out 10 then nine, you know, and then eight. <laughs> and then oh, I know the episodes you're talking about. And the about. rest yeah, of the yeah, party yeah, would say, oh, shit, he's counting down to something. You know, what is it? And I, I thought that would be kind of a cool, effective uh, a technique to use. And it's, it, it was what, you know, after what Brian said, I was like, that that's kind of where I, I, I think the effectiveness would be present in that. Ross, did you just pronounce the word innocuous as innocious? <laughs> uh, quite possibly. Oh, Did I? I am so. I, I'm sorry. I'm so fucking happy that I am not the one that mispronounced something. I'm sorry. Send your emails to <laughs> Ross str- at the gaming gamers tavern. Dot here's a here's a here's a <laughs> bunch of dudes. Dot org. Dot org. I have a really good friend who learned all of her silver dollar words from books while she was growing up, sort of moving around the Me too. world. Right. Me too. <laughs> and yeah, she she's damn near forty. And there's nothing I like better than making fun of her about it. Well, I want to tell one other quick story also about, a, a, you know, a technique involving talking to the to the players. So my my party, when, when we were running Shadows Angeles, they liked to sort of talk amongst themselves and try to figure out what was going on in character. And they would spend quite a bit of time doing this. And, and as a GM, it was, it was wonderful to just kind of shut up and sit back and let them do things from time to time. Um, but I remember I wanted to uh, I wanted to introduce kind of a shock value moment into the game. So during one of the sessions when all the characters are back at their police station and they're, they're all discussing, you know, what's going on. Um, I just kind of offhandedly said, so are you going to draw weapons for the day? Um, and this is, this is a thing that, you know, usually happens kind of off camera. I just sort of say, and then you draw weapons and then you get in your cruiser and then you go somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but today I just said, well, are you going to send someone to, you know, collect your weapons from the armory? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll send Mike's character. And they get back to talking. And I'm like, all right, that's fine. And, and you know, I just looked at Mike and I say, okay, so you go to the cage. And I start just sort of role playing out, you know, drawing weapons from the armory, uh, which happens to also be uh, the evidence cage. So Mike's just sort of only half paying attention to me, you know. <laughs> uh, but he's like, okay, I go up to the counter and, and she says, well, how many, how many guns do you need? And he says, well, I've got five people in my squad, so I need five guns. She goes, okay. Meanwhile, you know, the rest of the party is all just still talking, going over various theories and so forth. And I start counting off guns. I'm like, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> and well, you need a you need a drop gun. Michael looks at me just in time for me to mime picking up the sixth gun and shooting myself in the head. Whoa, what? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And that was Mike's response of like, holy shit. <laughs> yeah. See, the thing is that the evidence cage is where they put all the, the nasty, horrible, cursed items that they picked up over the last few sessions. Oh, my God. And one of them had an impact. One of them got and to it. Holy shit. It, that's exactly the response I got from the whole group. was, holy shit, the, 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 the girl oh at the evidence counter just shot herself in the head right in front of us. And I'm like, yeah, and that was the shock value. That was something wonderful that I thought really added to the overall atmosphere of that game because they were they were then like, oh man, you know, it just it kind of it yanked them out of something familiar. Mm-hmm. I am so stealing that shit. Oh my god, <laughs> See, Ross, you just Ross, you just brought up a really important thing that sort of ties back into my naiad in the in the water pipes thing is making something familiar horrible. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, using... that's what Kubrick was amazing at in film. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, Hitchcock as well. And since, yeah, and since you mentioned that, why don't we spend a minute talking about using other media and studying other media and the way it informs your game master? Because if you're going to run a good horror game, you're going to run an effective horror game, and you're going to scare the hell out of the people at your table, you need to know how to do it. And you need to be familiar with how it's done in books, you know, how it's done in, you know, in, in everything from, you know, Lovecraft to 
Stephen King, you know, to any other, you know, good horror writer you can think of, you know, to Kubrick's films, to stage plays, to stage plays, you know, and, and pay attention to things that are horrible that are outside of the, out of the horror genre. For example, are you guys familiar with the uh, Jim Jarmusch film Dead Man? No. Came out in the mid to late 90s. It has Johnny Depp in it. It has uh, Gary Farmer in it. It has a whole bunch of other guys in it. He, It's a Western. And he goes out West and he's shot in the very beginning of the movie. And he spends his the entire rest of the movie dying slowly mm-hmm. because the bullets Ooh. lodge next to his heart. And he's being guided by this Indian name, named um, Nobody, played by Gary Farmer, who thinks he's act- he's his character name is William Blake. Nobody thinks he's actually William Blake, the poet. <laughs> and and he is taking him to the afterlife. And it's... I don't know if you guys are, have ever seen any other Jarmusch movies, but they're basically like two-hour fever dreams. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Dead Man is a two-hour fever dream as Johnny Depp's character slowly dies from being shot and blood use. And he becomes this, like, avenging angel and kills all these dudes, and he has no idea what he's doing. And it's it's terrifying. <laughs> the whole The whole movie is absolutely terrifying. And the pacing is really strange. Everything's just off about it. Everything is just like a step off or a key off. No, you're mm. right. I think, you know, I if I had to pick something I learned a lot from, it was actually Stephen King's uh, short stories, particularly 1408, which is from, uh, was eventually made into a movie, but the uh, the short stories in a book called Everything's Eventual. But the point is that the, the short story, 1408, what I loved about it was that it introduced these things that just really didn't make any sense. There were moments that were frightening because they were completely nonsensical, because they were they were so bizarre that your mind, you know, kind of retreats from it almost. And I, I, I took inspiration from that when I was designing um, Omega Sector, which is, I, I mentioned earlier in the, the podcast, it's this area sort of between our world and the and the cosmic horror that is where the, the, the which is called the Black World. And uh, when the characters went into the uh, Omega Sector, I tried very, very hard to make it a place that was extremely memorable in a number of ways. Um, and one way I did that is by introducing parts of, of Omega Sector as just not making any sense. Uh, and I'll give you an example. The player characters come across an intersection of, uh, of two streets, and in the middle of the intersection is this pile, almost like a tower, of television sets that have just been placed you know, in this circle, and they're all clearly unplugged. Right? That totally doesn't go there. But all the television sets are on, even though they're unplugged, and they're just showing the most bizarre scenes, and I, just, I, I wrote up like two or three of them. You know, there's a guy just sort of shouting numbers directly at the camera, and there's you know just a big un- you know big eye that slowly blinks and unblinks, and the player characters just kind of stood there and looked at this, and it, w- it wasn't a threat, you know, it wasn't anything that was going to you know actually cause damage or harm in any way, but it really, to me, I think that was kind of the crown jewel of of them taking away from Omega Sector the idea that this place was not of our Earth. You know, that it was not someplace they were meant to be. Uh Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned, you talk about Stephen King, the short story Night Shift. Yeah, that's a great great one. The thing with the rats. Yeah. And the giant sort of queen rat underneath the the textile factory. Yeah. That's, that's not, that's like something normal. Rats, you know, vermin infestation, cranked up to 11. But also, there was nothing... In that, you know, there was nothing in the story that suggested that that queen rat was like an alien, you know, something from beyond time or anything. It was just a very old, very big rat, you know, and that's terrifying. <laughs> you know, it's like it's yeah. like a giant spider. And that's actually leads me very, very roundabout way to one of the greatest ways to build tension in a in any storytelling medium, including gaming, is a lesson I learned from Hitchcock in one of his writings that he did where he explained the best way to build tension in a story is to show a ticking timer. Mm. He talked about the scene where two people are talking in the cafe, except before you see them talking, shot opens. You see the time bomb in the thing ticking down from three minutes. And then you pan over to the two people sitting at the table talking. And then they're just talking normally, like two normal people. 
But the tension just keeps mounting because in the back of your head, the characters don't may not know that they're about to get blown to Kingdom Come. But you as the audience know something that the characters don't know. Do you think Hitchcock would have loved 24 of them? Because <laughs> it's always counting down. <laughs> <laughs> No, but seriously, your idea of using a timer, you know, that's a great point. And you could probably, that's that's a good thing to have something like a, uh, a tablet or something for. You know, you could use that as a big display if you wanted to during a game with a countdown on it. Especially if your players are, like mine, bad about spending half an hour agonizing over the next turn in combat, which takes six seconds. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, well. I did something similar to that in a Thin Blue Line one-shot. And it's not a timer. It's the players are firefighters. Oh. And they're in a fire. They're in a fire in an abandoned factory. And they have to... There are supposedly people in them. And of course... (laughs) I like the way you put that. Well, I mean, that's the report. (laughs) That's the report. Yeah, but no, I like the way you put that. That's, That's beautiful. You know, and they have to go in there. And the fire is the ticking time bomb. The fire, The fire is the timer. And the fire does something new every turn the fire is its own thing and it's constantly moving and acting like it has initiative that's cool yeah Yeah, i like that and actually i I actually converted that game over to savage worlds when i converted all my other games over to savage worlds and i turned it into a um or i'm turning it into a um what are they called dramatic encounter Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and i'm excited to see how that runs but yeah the fire is its own thing and the players can't dick around because if they dick around in one spot too long, a beam is going to fall on them. Or the floor is going to fall out from under them. Or there's going to be an explosion. you know, Or they're going to get jumped on by hellhounds or salamanders. <laughs> not, not, not that there are hellhounds or salamanders in the building. Fire elementals. There's actually a fire yeah. elemental in the basement. That, <laughs> that could be a really frightening thing for a firefighter to face, yeah. actually. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very much so. Well, it, it's, it, it's basically the middle of winter and some homeless people accidentally summoned fire. That's really playing into the idea of bringing reality into gaming where this could have had a mundane source for the fire. Mm -hmm. Or it could have been magical. Who knows? And it's also the allegory of even if it was the fire elemental that started the fire, but the player still have to deal the effects one way or the other, whether it was, oh, hey, I'm a 19-year-old who's bored and... I'm a pyromaniac, I'm going to start a fire in this tenement building that I think is abandoned, mm-hmm. versus a magical force is causing this. Right. Yeah, it, when you're running a game, when you're running a horror game, setting it someplace that you know, and using that knowledge, and using it against your players, is is very rewarding. And it should be relatable, it should be something that exactly. they you know, can, can understand. I mean, I, I have a blog post about setting the scene where I talk about you know, trying to trying to use the things that are around you, use the things that players are familiar with, mm-hmm. and and make that part of your description. You know, if you want to say how tall something is, or how long it is, or how far away it is, you can just point to things that are right outside the window and say, well, it's four parking lots. You know, it's a good way to get that sense of scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, just use something relatable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we have spent a lot of time this past hour talking about how to build tension in a game that you're running. I would like to now talk about an issue that I have in my personal games with tension breaking. My players, at least in my last game that I ran, they're really, really into cracking jokes constantly at the table. And it's a big social thing for them. So every single time I would try to build tension in the game, they would do something funny. To the point where I actually ripped off from the Ravenloft books and you come across a beautiful woman who is standing at the edge of the lake and she starts slowly unrobing as she's about to take a dip in the lake and she takes off her robes and she takes off her under things exposing her naked body and then she unties the ribbon around her neck and she takes her head off of her neck and sets it on the stone and then dives into the lake and the whole point is to set the tone for the game and the fucking monk in my game went and stole the fucking head. 
Because it seemed like it was funny to him. Do you think I should, as a DM, rein in that sort of out-of-the-box behavior that completely adds this random element and everyone laughs at the table and destroys all my tension that I've been meticulously building up? Or should I shut that down? Well, I definitely have some thoughts on that, but I'd kind of like to hear what Brian has to think first. Uh, so. I think you just have to be honest. I think you start that, or you you curb that behavior before the campaign ever starts. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's one of those things where you just have to tell the players. You know, especially if they're friends, if they're people you've game with for a long time, it's look, guys. Here's the theme. Here's what I'm. Here's what I want to try to run. You know, a little dark humor and some laughs every now and then is going to be okay. But just don't, don't spill your Monty Python into my Ravenloft. This is gothic horror. I need you to respect the setting and respect my time. You have to, you have to set that tone early. And I think if most players at your table kind of hear that and respect it, it's always in the back of their head. You know, okay, do not use that woman's head as a soccer ball to get a cheap laugh. <laughs> you know, do, do not go Shaolin soccer on her head, okay? You know, don't do that. It's, it's, it's always something they'll remember. I actually agree with Brian here. I think, you know, communication with the, with the group is always, you know, my first resort, you know, mm -hmm. if, if there's something going on. I would say, you know, probably the first thing, if that happened in my game, I would probably just kind of stop the game for a second and say, okay, guys, let's, you know, here, here's the thing. And just sort of talk to them briefly and say, yeah. you know, I'm trying to, I, I, and, just, and just, you know, maybe explain it to, in, in your tone. Because what you want is you want all the players to buy into the game. You want them to all be on the same page with you. Mm -hmm. And if, if they're not willing to do that, if they're like, well, that's not really what we want to do, that's something you need to know, you know, early on, earlier on better than later. Yeah. Uh, but if they, but if they but if they are like oh you know yeah you're right okay good point then you can kind of move on and you know just understand that they you know maybe may have that as Brian says you know in the forefront of their mind now I would I would have one other suggestion for you when I was running Shadows Angeles we purposefully set aside a half hour at the beginning of every game and that half hour was just to get to sort of kibitz and talk and joke and talk about the you know latest TV shows and movies and yeah. it was a, it was a social half hour where we kind of got that out of our system and then we were like okay now we're ready to go into horror mode and play you know these people who are being faced with these horrific things yeah and I love that idea I, I love the the thirty minutes before to get a bite to eat like you said catch up on your week. You know, hey, I saw this funny video. Just socialize. Yeah, let's all look at this video and get a laugh, get it out of your system. You know, and then I typically try to run a four-hour session. So aside from people kind of getting up and getting a drink as we're going, I make a point at about the two-hour mark to go, okay, guys, let's let's all take a break at the same time. Good idea. And just talk a minute. Even if it's them just kind of going, oh, God, that last encounter, or, oh, I hate this NPC, or, you know, trying to logic out a puzzle or something, it's... It's that break of the tension that's intentional. Instead of it happening accidentally, like Daryl said, and just ruining all the work you put into it. Because I think having those discussions with the players, it's the way I've always come at it is it's a respect thing. You know, I'm putting way more time into preparing this game than you are sitting here playing it. So yeah, just kind of respect that. You know, it's gothic horror. Yeah, funny stuff is going to happen, but <laughs> don't make a point to just start derailing encounters just because you're you want a cheap laugh it's just it's not cool in my opinion yeah yeah and i think as we said you know communication and getting getting things straight from the start is always is always really important mm -hmm. i will have i will say this though that there are times that you you as a gm even even with getting everyone's buy-in and even with being able to communicate frankly with your players Sometimes there are just going to be situations where that's not going to be possible, like at a convention game, like yeah. where it's a one shot. And in those circumstances, I, I guess I would have to say that I think you kind of have to go with what's going to make the most fun game, not what's going to be the best story or, or even, you know, necessarily the scariest if you're running a horror game. But, you know, in, in those cases, I think you would have to defer to just everyone having a good time. And I'll give you a good example. I was running a game of Dark Heresy at a convention in Maryland. And I had come to the table fully prepared to run, you know, dark, you know, all the way grim dark Warhammer forty thousand. I was gonna, I was gonna just, you know, be as grim dark as I possibly could. 
I, I just like the ter- I like the term grim dark. I'm gonna be as yeah. grim dark as I can here. Yes. Yeah. And w- one of my friends showed up to the game, and his name is Robert Dorf, and he is a fantastic gamer and a fantastic DM, and a very 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 good friend of mine. But Robert is not he is not a Warhammer 40k guy. He is not a grim dark guy. Okay. Robert's participation in the game, not just him, but I mean there was other people as well, and they just kind of took a different approach to the setting. They were seeing things and having fun with it, but they were having fun with it in a way that was very irreverent and very, you know, I, I won't say Monty Python, but like, you know, just almost like a parody. Right. And that's... Young Frankenstein. And that's the way that... Yeah, Young Frankenstein. And they mm-hmm. were having a lot of fun with that. I could tell that everyone was really enjoying that approach. And I just kind of threw my my concerns away. And I was like, okay, you know what? If that's what everybody wants to play, if that's what everybody's having a good time doing, let's do that. And, and I embraced it. And, you know, I, I won't say it was the most fun uh, 40K game I've ever had. I won't even say it was um, the most memorable 40K game I've ever had. But it was memorable. And it was fun. And everyone did have a good time. So I considered it a success. Even though it was completely opposite of my ex- expectations at the beginning. Does that, does that make sense to you guys? Oh, that makes, it makes total mm-hmm. sense. And, and honestly, I think that to me that shows the sign of someone who's... I hate saying good GMs and bad GMs, but... It, it's that thing of, to me that shows the sign of a GM who's done this for a while because I think it's like you said you have to you reach a certain point typically early in the in the session especially at convention sessions like you said if if this is what the crowd wants then that's what I'm going to give the crowd I want them to have a good time so are you not entertained are you exactly <laughs> are you not entertained you know if if I show up to run Grimdark and they want Scooby Doo then I'm going yeah. to I'm going to drift a little more Scooby Doo, just because I know they're having a good time. Yeah, so um, that there's a big difference there, obviously between your your home group and, and campaign and people yeah. you know really well. But yeah, I, I thought that was something worth bringing up. No, yeah, absolutely. Does that help at all, Daryl? <laughs> yes, yes, it does. You know, if I was thinking about one other thing um, that I would talk about for horror games, it would be um, actually regarding the rules and the mechanics of the game. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think one way to help emphasize that is is to introduce some permanent effects in the game. And I don't mean just like bigger damage, but like the risk of death is a thing that should be in the game. The risk of, you know, like uh, Call of Cthulhu has madness. I mean, eventually you're just going to go insane, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. and yeah. having having these these things that are at stake, these permanent issues, I think does also help kind of bring the game a little more into focus for for people and they don't feel so removed from it where it's just a few hit points here and there. You know what I mean? A good example is like when I'll, when my characters emerged from a mega sector, which as I've mentioned before, you know, I tried very hard to make it as, as horrible as possible. All the scars from a mega sector were left on the inside. For example, one of my characters, uh, after he left a mega sector, he would always have this hyper awareness of flies. If there was ever a fly in the room, he would just be extremely aware <laughs> I love that. of where it is and, and watching him and things like that. You know, and that's just a little. I mean, it's not like a permanently. It's it's not like I crippled him or anything. It's not like I left him horribly altered from his his previous form. But he had something. He had that scar that he could carry with him. Mm-hmm. It was a neat little way to sort of remind him of the horror of that setting. It's just you know, hey, there's flies buzzing around that trash can, and one of them's looking at you. And, and in my and in my opinion, in my opinion, that honestly, stuff like that just makes the characters more interesting. Yeah, but it's it's also but it's also something permanent that's at stake. Now, Daryl mm-hmm. mentioned before he had a character, a, a player who, who had to leave the table for a while, and he turned that guy into a mole. And I had a guy in Shadows Angeles who actually um, left the campaign during the Omega Sector area. This is a good friend of mine named uh, Robert Harrison, uh, or Dr. Bob, as we like to call him, because he's an entomologist. Unfortunately, he uh, he had some situation come up where he couldn't couldn't be part of that campaign anymore. And when he left, I said, well, okay. And it was a great opportunity for me to show just how lethal the setting was, because I instantly killed this character. Wow. I, bas- I basically told the group, I said, well, you, you know, the next time you turn around and look for uh, Bob's character, which uh, I forget his name, unfortunately. Um, you know, he's been torn in half and yeah. it was, it was, it, it was not super unsettling, but at least one of my players was like, Oh, Hey, Oh, okay. I kind of thought, you know, he might be coming back and I'm like, well, he's not. And <laughs> that guy is dead. 
And, you know, it, it just, don't be afraid to have that risk of death. I mean, there's, this is actually a much larger subject, but a lot of GMs like to fudge rules. They like to sort of put up that GM screen and, and say, you know, well, that was a critical hit, but it only did, you know, 10 damage. I think in a horror game, I think it's better to roll all the dice in the open and just make sure the players know that the risk of death, and I'm not saying you have to kill your characters, and certainly don't kill your players. Right. But uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but if you but if if the risk is there, if they know that it's possible for their people to die, uh, their characters to die, that's going to change the stakes of the game and and kind of make it. I think a little. It's going to make their victories a little sweeter too. Though. Absolutely. I mean, it, that's the thing for me. You know, I mean, I've I've been playing game. I've been playing RPG since I was ten. Most every group I've had understand that I have a very simple thing that I tell new groups and new players. Every time they sit down to play, it's, I'm fair. I, I care about your character probably more than you do, honestly, because I'm building campaigns around them and whatnot. And the simple statement that I make is, I do not like to kill characters, but I will. Well, the dice will. <laughs> or, or the dice will, really. I mean, because that's the thing is, I, I let them know that instances of fudging, you know, of a GM fudge, they're going to be very rare for me. Because I, I believe in dropping the dropping the dice and letting them fall. and Let the dice fall where they may. Exactly. And the, my players know that. So, there, like you said, there is that that threat. You know, there is that, okay, he... Something we, permanent can happen. To yeah, we yeah. can lose or we can lose or have our characters scarred in some way. And I think you have to do that. Otherwise, it's just, it's to me, it's not as fun, you know, especially if it's a character that I've played for a while and I'm invested in, knowing that the, the character you played for seven, eight levels, you know, and had all these adventures and had all these, these great stories and moments with, at a moment's notice, something horrible could happen. So I think you have to do that. Well, that's pretty much all I had left, I think, to talk about with regards to horror gaming. But um, I wanted to make sure to get that out. And, I, and mm-hmm. Brian, I want to say thank you for uh, you know following me up on that because it, you know sometimes uh, I wonder if this is what a lot of GMs are doing or if it's just me. And apparently, it's not just me. So no, that makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not alone. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> all right. All right, gentlemen, we're at last call, so let's get the hell out of here. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Jason, for being on the podcast tonight. But thank you very much for having me on. And we would like to thank you very, very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Where can we find you on the web? On the web, you can find me at amalgamatedfiction.com. That will take you to the Amalgamated Fiction landing page where you can find my blog, you can find my Facebook page, you can find my Twitter account, and my, my poorly maintained Tumblr. And what's the most recent project you've been involved with? Uh, with Accursed, with Ross and John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and hopefully look for Thin Blue Line next year. And Brian, thank you very much for being on with us tonight as well. Now, Brian, if we want to find you on the web and learn more about what you're doing these days, where, uh, where would we go? Uh, the place you can find me more than anywhere else is at my site at d20monkey.com. Letter D, two zero, monkey.com. Uh, that's where you can find my comic and pretty much keep up with what's going on with me or you can find me on twitter uh, at d20 monkey you can watch me watch me make watch me make stupid jokes and on bad days probably (laughs) probably rant about my day job without specifically ranting about my day job (laughs) well brian i want to say it's really cool to meet someone that i've you know actually been publishing a book with because that's that's fairly rare aside from uh actually having um you know Jason on tonight too because mm-hmm. you know we worked together for quite a while. But as I said, you know Legends and Layers is is a is a very cool memory to have, and I'm 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 super stoked that uh, we got a chance to meet and talk about it because uh, uh, that's very cool to me. Yeah, that's uh, doing that work in that period of time. That's that's something I'm never going to forget. That that was a very good time for me. And yeah, like you said, it's always nice to occasionally run into somebody. <laughs> who you never put a face to, but you may have saw it, you, you may have read their name in passing, you know, on right. that contributors list or something like that, and go, oh wow, you know, that guy, hey, hey that guy, you know, <laughs> what did you do in the book? Oh, I did this, you know. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, it's just that's always neat for me, you know. Uh, Absolutely. 
Well, it looks like the Queen's Guard is about to make their rounds for curfew, so we'd better make ourselves scarce. We'd like to thank you for joining us at the Gamers Tavern tonight, and we'd once again like to extend our thanks to Jason Marker and Brian Patterson. If you'd like to support You All Meet in a Tavern, please rate us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. For links to these outlets, as well as for tonight's show notes, please visit GamersTavern.org, and while you're there, browse around to read our blog posts and consider leaving a comment, visiting our sponsors, or clicking on the donate button. On behalf of Ross Watson, we'd like to thank you for listening, and until next time, the tavern is closed. Hello, random stranger who's totally not just me using a different voice. Well, hello, incredibly handsome stranger. Hey, have you heard about the new Dementalism Kickstarter? It's totally awesome. It's this really great game, and I know you're going to love it. Really? Tell me more. Well, see, you play these guys who work for the Primordial Soup Kitchen, and a whole bunch of clones have escaped because of something you did because you really suck at your job, and you have to go out and collect them before you get fired or fed to something horrible. It's super, super fun, I promise. Oh, yeah? How do I find it? Oh, it's very, very simple. Just go to www.dementalism.com. Really? It's that easy? Yeah, and it's brought to you by Mother Oid Creations, the good people who brought you low life and other really awesome stuff. Dude, you totally have to check that out.